wood turners do an awful lot of candlesticks. And uh, I had long ago, a friend of mine in Maryland where I grew up and lived for many years, um, in the heat of August summer, she had a treasured uh, collection of candles. She had recently moved down from the mountains of Pennsylvania to the eastern shore of Maryland by the river. And in our hazy, hot, and humid weather, her candles had just drooped over. Actually, one turned a complete 180. And uh, she was um, quite distraught and called me up. She knew that I turned and she said, I need you to turn me some candles, not candlesticks, but candles. <laughs> and I said, okay, thinking it was a bit strange. And then she uh, uh, showed me what, what she had in mind. And I said, fine, I'd be happy to do it. So in the heat of the summer, uh, wax candles are perhaps not the thing to put in direct sunlight and um, uh, we replace them with the wooden candle and mm -hmm. go from there. So I begin with a model that she had, uh, this is not it, but this is another candle I have on hand. It's a nice little uh, green candle and typically when we start our uh, project, we start by thinking about what type of wood to use. And I'm going to use, for the purposes of this demonstration of spindle turning, I'm going to use a piece of cherry with some sapwood in it. And you can see the, the white color, which is a sapwood, and the reddish color, which is the heartwood. And after I've decided which end to, to go with, I have a couple more blanks here, if they're needed. And I will point out that wood, wood turning and woodworking is inherently a dangerous activity that one of the things we do is we protect, number one, our eyes. And my glasses, although they're trifocals and they allow me to see better, they are uh, fairly expensive safety glasses as well. Mm -hmm. And I uh, am here in the shop literally every day, seven days a week. It's a, it's a retirement job and business that I really like. And they say, if you can find a job you like to do all the time, uh, it's not like it's a job. It's, it's more like it's um, a favorite thing to do. What I'm working on is a mini lathe, it's called. It is a little bit smaller and easier to hoist around. It's also quieter and quicker to start and stop. I use this as a teaching station because I'm typically starting and stopping the activity and talking in between the uh, times that my students go to the, one of the other lathes in the shop and practice what we have just learned and gone over. So I'm mounting, a uh, spindle turning is interesting because it's literally, and this will be a better example of it, it's mounting a piece of wood with the grain running between the centers. And people recognize spindle turning. Uh, some of it's fairly ornate. And if you go to the manor in Castine, <coughs> Castine and, and look at the, the uh, balusters there and the um, staircase, they are lovely and ornate. They are barley twist spindles with, with a very famous Victorian um, profile on them. They and there are a number of columns. I do a number of porch columns. I've done several here in Castine, replacement columns for some of the big houses, uh, newel posts, and of course, all kinds of handles. Wood turning, every town in colonial times had a wheelwright and they had a blacksmith and they had a wood turner. And wood turners made things like handles for pots and, and uh, knives and all kinds of things. And then, uh, unfortunately for wood turners in the 1930s or 1920s, plastic came along and a mold could be made and somebody could just pour the handle and you didn't need to turn it. Uh, it's interesting to note that the um, uh, professional baseball bats are still made of wood, mainly because the aluminum bats, uh, those guys are so good at swinging that bat and already sending it out of the park uh, over the monster wall at Fenway um, that an aluminum bat might send it into the next state. 
so they're custom made and they used to be all made by hand until about 10 years ago. Uh, there were, I think what happened was they just couldn't find enough experienced wood turners uh, to do them. At any rate, we're going to come back to this piece of cherry and, and uh, I'm going to begin by using what's called a roughing gouge and a skew chisel, a beating and parting tool, and a, and a medium-sized gouge. And these all allow me to basically power carve. Because the lathe is spinning the wood and turning it, uh, I'm able to take this tool and by carefully using the bevel, the sharpened edge here, um, I can manage how deep a cut to make. So it's, it's a lot more involved than just sort of pushing a, a, a pointed instrument into the side and grinding it out, as you'll see. Uh, particularly when I get into small thin things. So my lathe is turning just about 900 RPM. Uh, generally 800 to 1200 RPM is optimal speed for hand turning. And uh, we don't need to go a lot faster. I'm going to take this from its round position to a, from its square position rather, to a round position, simply roughing it with the roughing gouge. Actually, as it became rounded, if you were listening carefully, you heard a change in the sound. And you'll hear it again while I get the other end. So the sound is important. I have enough experience in the shop that sometimes when I have a student here, by the sound, if I'm not right there watching carefully, I can know what mistake they made and how, how to correct it. I'm going to use a micrometer because the bottom part of this candlestick needs to go in the hole. Sorry, in this candle. It needs to go in a hole that will be in the candlestick. I'm using a beating and parting tool. I know I have preset an adjustable caliper for the middle. And now I'm going to go up and dimension the top of the candle. You can see that the top roughly is about the size of my little caliper. In this particular demonstration, I'm acting as a production turner. And so my goal is to be able to work fairly quickly. I also know that the audience might not have the same appreciation for turning that I have. I think you can see, I don't know, but we'll see in the video, uh, that there are some ripples in this. That's from the roughing action. I'm now going to use a skew chisel to define the top. And to smooth it. part of this is to get the taper right. And as you can see, we're coming pretty close up on the top part. We'll fix the bottom shortly. Pull rest down. 
And now, I, knowing I want that bottom portion to be in the right place, stop this long enough you can see it's much more smooth here from the knife and we'll finish this up I'm using my left hand to support the work in fact I'll take it away for a minute and you can hear the vibration there, and that'll leave a rough spot. So by giving it a little bit of support with my fingers, I'm able to get it a lot more smooth. Allowing me to come back with some sandpaper, which is fairly fine. For this, I'm going to go up to a 600 grit sandpaper. And actually, I want to keep the same dust on there. I'm using a bouncy towel and a special mix finish, which is in an old uh, soap canister. This is called a friction polish. I find generally this friction polish. A lot of people find it smells good. <laughs> it is non-toxic when it's dry. It's almost dry now. I'm actually drying it with the heat of the friction. And for those who are furniture builders, if they're familiar with what's called a French polish, this is very similar, except that the lathe is doing the work and I'm just avoiding burning my hand. So there is my cherry candlestick, a red one with a white splash. I'll drill a little hole in the top and I have some fine cotton twine that will act as a wick and uh, we can hope nobody's going to light it. It'll just burn the wick and hopefully the candlestick, the candle will not burn. Again, the grain is running between the centers of the lathe. I used a roughing gouge, a skew chisel, a, a medium-sized gouge, and a beating and parting tool to give that shape.